Hello everyone, this is Rajesh Isan Gupta and we are talking about threads of uh, visual, um, threads of exploration, visual exploration, textiles and allied practices. Now here, in the last lecture we have ended our discussion on this particular kind of cotton fabric which is called muslin in which the thread count can go up to 1000 and for that reason which is also this this fabric has also been known as woven air now what we find that i mean how this kind of fabric is then um, uh, sort of implemented back on that uh, on the paintings or in the visual representations in the left side of the screen we have an image of um, Shah Jahan and this is an image which was drawn in the Mughal court and by uh, Muhammad Abed who was a son of Akhariza and, and then this, is, uh, this painting is done in the early 17th century and in this one what we find here is that Shah Jahan is wearing an angrakha or a jama which is this long which is which starts from the shoulder and then like I mean it sort of like I mean flows until the knee knees or like beneath the knees and where we find that I mean he is shown here wearing this jama but this jama is almost transparent in the in the upper body we can almost see part of his body this uh, tone of his skin and everything else but still like I mean he is wearing the jama and then in the lower body we can very well see the pajama which is there this slightly this purplish tone of the pajama is also revealed through this jama which which is there on the top layer of it so this sheer quality this daftness quality of the fabric is something that we find that is there in this in this portrait was achievable only because of this kind of muslin so the muslin that we have on screen in the right side in which we can see that i mean if a hand is passed through this layer of muslin cloth then the hand with its color and everything is revealed through the its layer and similar kind of character we can also find that to be there in this miniature painting which was made more than 300 years from today and in which one we find that i mean how in this one how this sheer quality this daftness nature of the fabric is exemplified now we also need to understand that i mean if we are talking about this particular kind of cotton it does not mean that i mean this kind of cotton was available to everyone so this is a very specific kind of cotton which was only made in part of the eastern india mostly in in bengal so that means that i mean uh, it is not something that was easily available to most of the people in the in in bengal uh, so uh, this is this is this very specialized mean of cotton production this muslin production went uh, side by side with many other production of coarse cotton and that's the reason what we find here is this very specialized uh, this this cotton production muslin production was reserved for the highest of the authority and that's the reason we do not really see this kind of muslin cloth is been worn by the the people who will be working in the agricultural field or like i mean even the local zamindars or the landlords and people like them so if this is one of the things we find we also see that i mean bengal in the 16th and 17th century was one of the highest revenue um, uh, generating state for the Mughals so for for that reason like I mean flaunting their um, uh, dominance over Bengal is something that is also implied through like I mean having this very expensive and super specialized muslin cloth on their body and being featured in this miniature painting so having this particular kind of fabric in this painting is not coincidental it is not something that we can consider to be just a choice but it was a very conscious choice for the emperors also for the artist to uh, proclaim certain uh, this this political aspects of the Mughal rule that how Bengal was under the dominance of the Mughals during that time and then like I mean the the most precious perhaps the most precious um, um, textile that came from Bengal is then we find that to be reserved for the highest of the authority of the Mughal rule so in this ways we find that how this material we are talking about if we go with the thread count thread count which can go between like 500 to 1000 and how that kind of material uh, quality and then the technique of spinning and weaving and then making 
muslin or woven air is something that is it has its one aspect that is related to the technicalities materiality and everything else on the other hand we find that to be like i mean how the the skill of like i mean particularly making this kind of yarn is is there it's a very specialized kind of skill uh, we are talking about the local knowledge but then the local knowledge and then the material technique all of them are then connected to the state politics and then how all those things kind of like I mean come up in the visual representation or the visual representation bear certain indication towards all these complicated relationships and in which we find that the cotton fabric is is there present but then like I mean the cotton fabric is present here as a reminder of all these different kind of relationships between material technique skill knowledge system politics culture and so on so that is how we can also see that how textile like i mean starting with like i mean the materiality of the textile can lead us to understanding the larger patterns of of societal and cultural flow so after cotton we uh, talk about silk fiber and in silk fiber we as as i have already mentioned that silk is something that is extracted from animals it, it is a protein based fiber unlike cellulose based fiber so cellulose based fiber as cotton is something that is one of the hardest fibers to dye and then like i mean silk and wool will find that to be much more receptive to dyes so what happens with silk production so silk production we find that from the northeastern region in india had been active in in making silk as stephen cohen textile scholar he argues or or he proposes that i mean how for for the at least for the last three millennia or even more than that there were uh, silk production um, north eastern parts of india now in terms of uh, silk production what we find that to be there is that the broad um, generalization is that uh, the mulberry silk that was mostly uh, cultivated in china that showed the path to the other asian countries for making a uh, silk and including the indian subcontinent however some of the early specimens which were found from north eastern india that that had shown that i mean it's not the mulberry silk which was primarily found from the northeastern regions but it was much more kind of the wild silk like the airy muga and so on so those kind of silk what we find that to be there in the northeastern states now after that there are also some of the uh, the, there are there are uh, um, also some of the other specimens which are found from the Indus Valley sites as well. So it is not quite clear if the Indus Valley sites they had silk production units there or the silk arrived from somewhere else in um, the Indian subcontinent. However, it also shows that I mean how the silk production was active uh, in in various parts of the Indian subcontinent even in the third millennia um, uh, BC and so like i mean so if this is this is something we find that to be there and mostly what happens in terms of like the mulberry silk production something that we uh, see there is that in the the um, the silk moths the silk worms are sort of like i mean fed this this mulberry leaves and that is how like i mean this this uh, um, that is how like i mean silk has been harvested for millennia and uh, this is one of the predominant uh, ways of harvesting silk that we find in china as well in the agricultural fields and all we will have the mulberry trees in the in the fields and so on and where uh, like i mean alongside agriculture the silk or the sericulture would also take place something we also find today in india as well and after like i mean this the silk worms would fed feed into this this mulberry leaves and then they will uh, 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 form this cocoon and this this cocoons we find it here in the left side of the screen in which we see that there is this structure made of bamboo and in which like i mean as many as cocoons that we can see them to be there that can be sort of like i mean kept and then these cocoons are allowed to sort of like i mean form this protective sort of a, um, a surface or like i mean a protective layer around them and this this fibery layer that that we find that to be there is the base of the silk now once like i mean this cocoon this this silk formation is done then then like i mean this cocoon 
spoons are then uh, boiled in water and that is how like I mean of course this uh, silkworms they die but then like I mean cocoons like I mean the silk is extracted this fiber is extracted so with this fiber extraction what we find that the fiber which is there on the outer layer of the cocoon is usually made into raw silk and then like I mean the fiber that is there in the inner part of the cocoon is something that is used for the finer silk. So processes we, we also find that to be there in uh, mostly like I mean how silk extraction process is sort of like I mean followed throughout. Now one of the very specific kind of silk we also find that to be there that is called um, the airy silk and airy silk is something that is called the ahimsa silk in which like I mean the uh, the silk the swarms uh, are allowed to sort of like I mean get out of this cocoon and then like I mean the silk is extracted from it this creatures they do not die and so that's the reason it is called as ahimsa silk um, uh, and and uh, how that is like I mean how this production process is different from the other um, um, much more sort of like I mean the uh, predominant means of silk production. Now in the uh, right side of the image we also find that there is uh, this this yarn making which is which is uh, going on here. So after like I mean this particular way in which this fiber is extracted from this uh, worms the silk worms and then it also sort of like I mean goes through the process of, of cleaning and then like I mean finally when we have like I mean the, the fiber ex being ready to be spun and then like I mean there's also sort of like I mean spun in the spindle different kind of spindle that can be and then like I mean the yarns are sort of like I mean made there. So a lot of times we find that I mean for silk it depends on what kind of um, worm we are talking about based on that we have also different uh, varieties of silk and also like I mean different kind of color we also find it there. So for example here we have like a number of different silk fibers and then like I mean how the silk this uh, uh, yarns are produced out of the fibers. So um, and, and this image is they, they, they come from the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum and in the side we have some of the uh, varieties of the, the wild silk as well as like I mean the cultivated silk and one can see here that I mean how here this particular kind of silk the, the luster of it or like I mean the shine in it is something that sort of sets it apart from the cotton yarn. So those kind of things we will find that I mean it's not just the shine but it's also like I mean the, the tactile quality of it. Also at the same time like I mean how this fiber would behave when we sort of make into a wearable fabric. All those things depend on this this um, the, the nature of this yarn and as I have already mentioned that, that the visual characteristic is not something that is separated from its material characteristics. So this this issues can be sort of like I mean also read into there. Now here like I mean if we compare this like I mean the kind of like I mean this um, the evenness in the fibers or like the yarn that we see here in this particular you know formation and how that is different from like I mean the yarn formation here it is much more kind of crimp and much more uh, sort of like I mean this this is not really uh, as fine as the one that we have in the left side of this image. So all these different kinds of silk we find that to be there and as I have mentioned that there are many different kinds of silk like the mulberry silk, airy silk, muga silk, tusser silk. So all those different kinds of silk all are extracted from this uh, silk warm they would um, result into different kinds of fiber and eventually like I mean leading towards making different kinds of fabric. So today what we find that uh, there are many different uh, areas in the Indian subcontinent where silk production takes place and then the mulberry silk production is something that certainly is the predominant one and that, that that's something we find that to be part of in eastern India, in Bengal, in Bihar, Jharkhand, Orissa and so on and then in southern India and part of it. Then we also have in Madhya Pradesh um, uh, the, the use of silk and everything else those are there. Now silk is something we, we uh, as, as I have mentioned that I mean there are many these varieties of the fibers that, that see there and then if we think about that I mean, how this varieties of fiber can lead towards different kinds of, of um, cloth 
that that example of that we can see in the right side of the screen and in the right side of the screen we have um, this uh, tasar weft ikat that is this one from Nuapatna in, in Odisha in which one we see that the tasar silk like I mean the this unevenness of the tasar silk or like I mean perhaps the kind of like I mean you know one can one can see each and every fiber of it. So those things we can certainly see that there in this tasar silk this stole and, and how that tasar silk is different from the airy silk of Kachar and Assam. So like I mean the airy silk that, that we that here and this is this is something that is different from like I mean how the tasar is there and then of course we also have the muga silk from Guwahati, Guwahati and Assam, Assam is known for its muga silk and I, I mean of course like I mean eri silk as well but like I mean also like I mean very much known for the muga silk and how the wearables are made from it. If you also make a comparison between like I mean how this three varieties of silk that we have on screen are there presented here we can also see like the kind of fold the crumb and everything else that that is there possible perhaps in this muga silk will not be the same way if we think about the tasar silk from Nuapatna in in Odisha so those also add to the these are not just like I mean some material characteristic but they add tremendously to the to the entire aesthetics also at the same time like I mean how it will appear once someone wears it. So with this discussions on silk we will go back to this image that we have already studied and, and that is the portrait of Shah Jahan. So if we have like I mean one part of the fabric that is this jama that I mean he wears on his body that is made of this fine Bengal muslin then something we find that to be there that is made of silk and that is the sash. I mean of course he also wears this like I mean this woven silk pajama that is there this bright purple color pajama but we also what I wanted to sort of like I mean focus on this particular sash or patka that we find that to be there on his waist and like I mean the ends of it is hanging right so this is this is something that we have like i mean the sash is also like i mean it's a wearable for men and we find that to be there very much in fashion during the early modern period in the indian subcontinent so uh, in the mughal court we find that i mean sash or patka is something that is worn by the courtiers and of course like i mean the royals and in this one we find that how sash is sort of like i mean tied in the waist and it is not just for tying and for just as a fashion statement but it is also uh, used for holding certain things so for example we find this visual dagger which is also tied to this sash in the waist line sometimes this waist cloth is also used for like i mean keeping money and other important resources which can be sort of like i mean pulled inside this sash so if this is something we find that to be there and then what what are the other characteristics we find in the sash we see that i mean of course like i mean these two ends are hanging and in these two ends we have also a lot of detailed uh, um, um, motifs so in the in the right side of the screen i wanted to show this another sash and that is um, it's a it's a sash with a floral border and in which both silk and cotton is used in in its warp and weft and then like i mean silk threads are then used for making the embroidered motifs that appear on on the on the border here so the the floral motifs that we find that to be there on the border and then the continuous creeper motifs that sort of like i mean run across this so those characteristics we definitely find them to be there featured in this sash as well in which we find that clear there are like continuous borders which are running there and in some cases we also find that I mean how there would be like I mean extra set of decorations or ornamentations featured in the in the in the ends of the sash so something that we have in this one in the right side of the screen so these are something we find that I mean how putting this object 
right beside the visual representation of the object can make us think about its larger relevance and then like I mean thinking about not only just as a fashion um, um, like I mean understanding like I mean you know what is the fashion during this time period what is prioritized what is not but also that I mean how different kinds of making this fabric or like I mean different kinds of uh, using them they, they also contribute a lot to the overall aesthetics of this particular kinds of cloth. Now to continue on that I wanted to show the entire sash that we have already seen in the in the earlier picture. Now why there is an impo I mean why there is a requirement for looking at this sash as just one untailored piece of fabric and then like I mean looking at it as something that is tied on the west line right so with that what happens is that when we see this one untailored piece of fabric with like this continuous borders here and then like i mean you know the extra ornamentation in the these two edges with those ones what we find that i mean how uh, the material made in the workshops of the of the makers the embroiders then how this fabric is like i mean when it is made the the wearer's perspective was already taken into a, account that the edges these two edges of it like i mean these two edges would be like i mean hanging from the waist and that's the reason like i mean those these two edges would be visible to the viewers and since like sash is something that is like sort of tied in the waist then like any decoration which comes perhaps in the middle of the cloth will not be visible to anyone and that is the reason the middle portion and most of the part of this fabric has been left without much decoration i mean it is not the same for all sashes but mostly we will find that i mean how there is always stress on this continuous borders and the edges which would be hanging and that is that also something that talks about how the aesthetics of sash is also intertwined with the utilitarian aspect of sash and here I just wanted to show this one sash of course like I mean this is the detail from the one we have already studied in which we see that I mean how this the silk threads are very um, carefully employed with with like I mean the color variation and everything to to show this marigold flowers and then how uh, the floral motifs are very carefully sort of selected and put forward in the edges of this sash with that we also look into that i mean the other kind of silk thread which is uh, much employed in brocade silk weaving and also for embroidery and so on and that we understand as zari or the metal wrapped silk thread so the in in this case what happens we find that i mean there are metal so for example there can be gold silver copper and so on and uh, when when metal is heated then there are ways in which like i mean how the metal uh, is uh, pulled from like i mean it, the entire matrix and then like i mean the pulling of the metal from it when it is heated when it is molten and then what happens is like i mean one can see that the wear formation that takes place for its elasticity then when this very thin wires are produced then it is immediately wrapped around the silk thread and then like that is how the zari threads are produced so in this case what happens we see that i mean the zari threads are something that that sort of like i mean it has a silk core and then like i mean the silk core would be like i mean wrapped with this metallic threads so there are two kinds of like i mean wrapping that we also find that to be there at least what like stephen cohen and rosemary krill they also suggest that one is like a z or z and the other one is like s so imagine like i mean if the uh, the if this is the silk thread and then like i mean the the metal thread is sort of like i mean wrapped like this which is anti clockwise then that is called the z sort of wrapping and then in the other way in which like i mean this 
clockwise oh, no. uh, wrapping is done and that is that is the one which is the s kind of like i mean wrapping now in this two cases what we find that in the mostly in the north indian samples and many of the samples which are found from deccan and also part of um, uh, southern india follow this z kind of um, metal wire wrapping however the ones which we find in iran and part of middle east in which we find that the s kind of carve is shown now <clears throat> for the s carve we also find that i mean in many of the deccani and south indian specimens would also feature this kind of s carve um, zeri threads and the zeri threads are something that we find that i mean if one of the ways in incorporating metal is to have like i mean this this zeri threads there are also other ways in which we find that the uh, different kinds of metallic em embellishments are employed in making threads so for example the the one we have in the left side of the screen we have that i mean there are different kinds of like i mean bits of me metal and then like i mean perhaps sometime like i mean pieces of metal which are incorporated in making this kind of zeri of course I mean, which are not really meant to be like I mean, worn directly on skin, but on the lay on top of some other layer. However, like I mean, how this kind of threads are also part of like I mean, making zari, and then the zari threads are also used in making this another very uh, special embroidery technique that is called as a dozi, in which we find that this different kind of like I mean, metal fragments and then like pieces of metal and different kind of embellishments are the ones which would. Would be incorporated there now in the side of the screen we have another sash that comes from deccan and from the 18th century and i'll just go through its um, uh, and it comes from the museum of fine arts uh, boston's collection and in this one i'll just go through the specificities of its technique so it is cotton plain weave with silk and gold colored metal strip wrapped on silk core embroidery silk uh, couched metallic yarns and metallic fringes so what we have here that i mean the, there is cotton plain weave that is there in the body but then like i mean the embroidery is done with like i mean silk uh, yarn but at the same time like i mean the zari yarn in which like i mean we have the gold colored metal strips and then like i mean of course the zari yarn which is also gold colored and then um, those those all are then employed for making the embroidery now we also find this uh, the metallic fringes which are then attached at the end of this fabric that is something that we find that how this zari is used not extensively in the embroidery but also in the fringes and fringes is something we can also imagine that if the ends of the sash is hanging from the waistline then the fringes would also be very much visible so for making uh, like i mean drawing attraction to that we find how the zari threads can be useful for it so this this is again going back to this idea about like i mean how utility aesthetics and making of these textiles all are interconnected and these different kinds of material which are used for making this one piece of fabric are also very much strategic and it's never really coincidental thank you we'll talk about the other materials in the next lecture